my gentle and of course very modern apes, I'm coming to you on a non-scheduled day because something very funny has happened. It seems my Jeffrey Tompkins takedown has caused quite a stir in the Young Earth creationist community and has caused Rob Carter, a Young Earth creationist geneticist who works with Jeffrey Tompkins quite frequently, to create a response video against me, the evil and vile gut sick Gibbon. Listen, sometimes it's okay to be the villain in the made up story that these people got going on in their mind. <laughs> Cause I'm telling you right now, I'm okay. I'm okay that in your story, I'm the villain. Cause you the clown in mine. <laughs> <laughs> a whole clown. Uh-oh, this is a mean Gutsy Gibbon video. Yes. When I create debunking videos, either of a response to me or content in general, like a like an ideology or concept in young earth creationism or some other kind of pseudoscience, I tend to have two modes. The first mode is science-based, right? We go through the concepts in gratuitous detail and we take them down piece by piece. And there are like a couple of jokes sprinkled in. And then the other mode is mostly joke based. Joke videos are reserved for truly egregious content that lacks substantial points or ideas or that has generally unprofessional behavior. Can you guess what mode we're going to be in today? Maybe, uh... For those of you out of the know, a couple of weeks ago, gosh, a couple of months ago now, I made a video that investigated the claims of a one Jeffrey Tompkins, a young earth creationist geneticist who focuses on plants, yeah, Rob Carter, this is important, who has been claiming from 2011 to present that the human and chimpanzee genomic similarity is actually much lower than the nefarious secular scientists would have you believe. He's put forward a lot of different numbers, a lot of different estimates, all of them are wrong for various reasons based in his methodology and his high school arithmetic skills. You can see my video that went into overly gratuitous detail as to why Jeffrey Tompkins' methods don't work, doesn't matter which methods we're using, they're all wrong for different reasons, like I said. But to sum it up, from 2011 to 2015, his methods, as copied and pasted from his own published work, will not yield a 100% similarity of a chunk of human reference genome to itself. Like, the issues with those early methods are greater than just using an ungapped parameter. His later methods, his 2018 works in particular, have a different problem. If you download his own CSV files, you'll find that he doesn't weight his sequences, and that's how he comes up with an 84% similarity between humans and chimps, as opposed to the conventional number, which is 91.1% for coding DNA and approximately 95 to 96% for the entire genome at present. Tompkins' issue is that, like I said, there's no waiting going on. So a sequence that is 300 base pairs long between humans and chimps and shares, let's say, 50% similarity is weighted as exactly the same as a 30,000 base pair long sequence that is 99% similar. Uh, this is something that you learn in high school at the very latest. Everyone has known that Tompkins' work is sus for quite some time, but to my understanding, I was one of the first to actually test his methods against controls, and this made creationists very angry, especially Rob Carter. So who the heck is Rob Carter? Well, Rob Carter is a young earth creationist who has his PhD in marine biology. Now, why did I call him a geneticist? Because he's worked in the field. He's worked in genetics. He's done some stuff uh, involving genomes. Great. That's awesome. I'm fine giving him that title. He will not be so gracious with me, as you will see. Rob Carter is posting this little piece from his YouTube channel, Biblical Genetics, but he has been around the creationist circle. In fact, we have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rob Carter, as it were, before. He's written an article about me, as well as uh, involving Dan and Dapper from Dapper Dinosaur. So he knows who I am. He's going to tell you that he knows me uh, as a critic. But he's also been involved in, like, the Dismantle documentary. He's done pieces at other creationist organizations. He has been a face in many different arenas of young earth creationism. And I guess he's taken it upon himself to respond to me, since Jeffrey Tompkins evidently won't. Rob makes it clear right off the bat that he wasn't planning on making this video. He was planning on giving a different presentation for this particular YouTube release, and that's gonna be more evident later. But from square one, you can just feel the disdain dripping off his lips. 
But a couple days ago, I watched a video, a long video, two hours long. It was, it was a trial to get through it. Oh, it was a trial to get through the video, huh, Rob? A trial to watch the whole video. A trial to watch the whole two-hour video, which you watched. It was a trial to watch the whole video. Well, at least we know you watched the whole thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be such a trial, right, Rob? That's called foreshadowing. It was uh, produced by a person I'm well aware of. I accidentally girl bossed too hard. Her name is Erica. She's a primatologist. Too bad you can't put well-known villain in Young Earth creationist circles on your CV. She's actually, um, she and Dan of Creation Myths fame uh, did a video against me several years ago called Robert Carter's Wrong About Everything, which I responded to on creation.com, an article, Robert Carter's Wrong About Everything, question mark. There'll be a link in the show notes for that if you like. Yeah, you know, it's weird because I'm pretty sure me and Dan responded to that response and received nothing. This case, Erica, the primatologist, has turned her sights on Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins of the Institute for Creation Research. Yes, this is true, Rob. As I sat in my medieval castle plotting the downfall of young earth creationism, I pulled him up on my large supervillain-esque monitor and I thought to myself, huh, you know that Jeffrey Tompkins? It's time someone took him down a peg. I mean, I guess that is maybe a little accurate because I did just get super tired of seeing the Jeffrey Tompkins numbers thrown around and I decided to, to do some tests for myself and see how well they held up. Uh, and then that led to the rest of the dominoes in Jeffrey Tompkins' career on this specific topic falling uh, over. Now, Jeff and I have known each other for a long time. I first met him when he was at Clemson. He was in their genomics department. He was building genomes for a living. Uh, since then, he's gone to the Institute for Creation Research, and full disclosure, he and I are both on the board of directors of the Creation Research Society. Okay, so Rob and Jeff know each other, and Rob is making a video to defend his friend Jeff. Got it. We have a small community of creationist geneticists, and the secular community, a small group of them, has taken it upon themselves to be our criticizers. <laughs> well, the gall of them, the insolence of criticizing... <laughs> Peer reviewing, if you will, creationist literature that is constantly demanding to be taken seriously by the rest of the scientific community. The absolute brazenness of some individuals with some spare time on their hands who are in the scientific community to give them exactly that. To give them what they want and assess their work on its own terms. Monsters. Like, what, what do you want, Rob Carter? Do you want to be taken seriously and peer-reviewed by the scientific community, or do you want to be left alone and considered a pseudoscience? You can't have both. And this long video, she's, she's slamming Jeff up and down. Video long, Erica mean. I hope you're ready for a second helping of that one, Rob. But also, like, this is the voice of someone who's never submitted anything to peer review, because peer review is oftentimes quite mean. I'm not saying it should be mean, in fact, quite the contrary, but this is just, you know, like, tell me you haven't submitted recently to a peer-reviewed journal without telling me you haven't submitted recently to a peer-reviewed journal. For supposed mistakes that he's made. Now, he is a gentle and quiet and unassuming person. I found him to be very humble. So what are we saying here, Rob? Because of these characteristics that you've experienced from Jeff, he doesn't deserve to be criticized for his scientific work? Is that what's being said here? Why are we talking about Jeff's character? I have opinions on that, but w what's the relevance? And he's not a bulldog, so he hasn't come back swinging, but he has put his foot down and said, no, I'm, I'm not wrong. And um, it did take him a while uh, to say that in a couple places, and that drives them to distraction. Why'd you take so many years to correct this? He's not on their timetable. He can do it whenever he wants. Oh, okay, I see. So Jeff is a nice guy. That's why he took so long to issue a correction on the bugged version of Blast. The problem here, Dr. Carter, is that this is something that I didn't do, right? I didn't say that Jeff wasn't valid because of the bugged version of Blast. In fact, I tested his methods once he accounted and corrected that bugged version of Blast, his 2015 methods. So, and then again, there wasn't a bugged version for 2018. So how exactly is this relevant, right? You're just saying Jeff's a nice guy. That's why he took so long to, to issue a correction for his like 2013 work. Okay, cool. How does that help him with all of the inaccuracies of the rest of his work after that? But he did take a while in a couple of cases uh, to um, publish some of his corrections. Now, one thing that happened though, 
was one of his chimpanzee human similarity estimates that he did. Oh, by the way, he's a plant geneticist, and one of the things that Erica criticizes, he's not a human or ape geneticist, so he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, no, he's a geneticist. First of all, I think it's really humorous that Rob is getting mad that I insinuated you can't talk out of your field of expertise because this is something that gets leveled at me all the time by creationists whenever I talk about genetics, by the way. But no, that's not actually what I said. What I did in my video is I noted that Jeffrey Tompkins is a plant geneticist, and that might be one of the reasons why he's had so much trouble with getting accurate results within his mammal comparisons, a human versus a chimpanzee. I'm trying to assign his inaccuracies, his shoddy work, to ignorance rather than deceit. And I'm trying really hard to do that, Rob. Now, on the other hand, she's trying to analyze this work in genetics and she's making some subtle mistakes of her own. Now, you know, I'm only human, so of course I make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. But my question is, like what? Which I'm not gonna go into, but it's clear that she's not a geneticist. That's right, baby. This is a 21 minute video about me, a response to me, and why my methods don't show that Jeffrey Tompkins is incorrect and has been for all these years, but we are not gonna go over why? And that is why, Dr. Carter, I will not be taking you very seriously at all in this video. Although we will talk about your waiting time problem. Rob talks for a little bit about the bugged version of Blast that plagued Tompkins' 2013 work. Now remember, the individual that caught this bug was Glenn Williamson, a friend of the channel who's helped me in a lot of these comparisons, but we didn't start talking until a few years ago. We certainly weren't talking when I was 17. However, that doesn't stop Rob Carter for saying that we are associates. And this one that he was using had an error, and it caused his percent similarity to be very low. And they pointed it out. In fact, one skeptic uh, associated with Erica, a computer programmer, he wrote the Answers Research Journal asking that his paper be published. So all these years ago, Glenn found out that there was an error in Tompkins' version of BLAST, and that's why the percent similarity was showing up to be 70% between humans and chimps. You'll notice that Tompkins does not propose 70% anymore, and shortly after that, he revised it to about 80% once he was using the non-bugged version of BLAST. But when Glenn brought it to everyone's attention that there was a bug, the resounding response from most creationists was, if there truly is a problem, then submit it to the Answers Research Journal, Glenn, or are you scared of creationist peer review? And so that's what Glenn did. He tried to submit to the Answers Research Journal, just like so many creationists challenge so many of us who frequently debunk young earth creationism to do. The editor of the Answers Research Journal, which is a young earth creationist research journal associated with Answers in Genesis, Andrew Snelling, dragged Glenn along for months as to whether or not his paper would end up being published. And at the end of the day, they told him that it wouldn't be. Shortly after that, Tompkins published his own article in the Answers Research Journal about the very same bug and did give Glenn Williamson credit, but I don't think that that's much consolation considering Glenn is the one who did all the legwork and wrote up an entire paper on it. Tompkins just didn't want his error to be pointed out by someone who wasn't him. On this matter, Carter has this to say, the problem is you can't publish the Answers Research Journal unless you subscribe to their statement of belief, which is, are you young earth creationist? Then you can publish here, and he obviously doesn't. And there's all these emails back and forth of pairing, and, and it's just very awkward and very long and very sorted, but I'm sorry, you just couldn't publish there. So there you have it, folks. The Answers Research Journal is only for young earth creationists. You cannot publish there if you aren't a young earth creationist. So now you have your canned response to every time a young earth creationist suggests that you take your issues with one of their workers or writers or scientists up with the ARJ. You can just tell them, sorry, I'm not a young earth creationist. They literally will not let me publish there. Now, remember, there is not a single other scientific journal that I know of. Or I guess I should just say, there's no science journal that I know of, since the ARJ is not a science journal, that requires you to sign a statement of faith before you publish there. Your work is assessed on the basis of how robust it is, not what you personally believe. So, you know, thank you, Rob, for being the only creationist I know of to actually admit this, that you aren't allowed to submit to the ARJ unless you subscribe to Young Earth Creationism. The question then is why was Glenn Williamson dragged along by Andrew Snelling in those sordid, awkward email exchanges for so many months if Snelling knew from the get-go that Glenn wasn't going to be allowed to publish there? Isn't that kind of weird, Rob? 
and probably um, your paper didn't meet the requirements of publication anyway. I don't know. I haven't read the paper. I just know that it was, um, it was rejected. Oh, okay. Well, it wouldn't have met the standard anyway. So, I mean, like, what's that based off of, Rob? You know you can find Glenn's paper as it was submitted to the ARJ online. How about you give it a read and get back to us? So, we know that there was an error in that program. The estimates are not in the 70s. His, most of his estimates are in the 80s. Now, is that wrong? Well, Erica um, claims that uh, these estimates are wrong for several reasons. Oh, okay, good. At least he's going to go over the reasons why I propose Jeffrey Tompkins' work is bad and shoddy and doesn't hold up to any kind of scrutiny, even by a non-geneticist, right? One is, there's a difference when you run a search using BLAST. Are you going to allow for gaps or not allow for gaps? And apparently he's using one of the settings, but if you use the other settings, you get a much different reading, you get a much higher similarity if you allow gaps in your search sequence. But he's dug in his heels and said, no, this is, this is appropriate. Now, I don't want to spend more time on that because to me, it doesn't matter. Very cool, Rob. Now, Dr. Carter's assessment of the difference between gapped and ungapped as Tompkins utilizes it shows that he didn't watch the video, and we're going to have some additional support for that here in a minute. But, like, remember, when we took Tompkins' methods in that video, copied and pasted from his own methods section, and then ran the comparison of a human reference genome to itself, the same exact strings, to themselves, it didn't give us a 100% similarity. In fact, it gave us like an 85-ish percent similarity. So no, these differences are not arbitrary. Gapped and ungapped are used for different types of comparisons. But also, Tompkins' methods don't work. They are screwy, even outside of that. Now, the reason Carter says it doesn't matter is because of this waiting time problem argument that he and others like Gunter Beckley have utilized before, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. First, Carter goes over how creationism, young earth creationism, can accommodate hierarchical patterns like nested hierarchies, and we've talked about this before, common design rather than common descent can work with nested hierarchies, but only within the regions of DNA that are functional and the phenotypes that, the, that they represent, right? Once we get into the regions of the genome that don't do anything to our knowledge, to our current understanding, they shouldn't also create nested hierarchies because they don't serve a design purpose. Creationists still won't respond to that other than to be like, well, the whole genome is functional. Okay, but then knockout tests, like we've been through all of this again and again and again. In the design criterion, God could have made humans and chimpanzees as similar or dissimilar as he pleased. We literally, now I don't believe this, but we could have had a single letter differences between our two species. One letter that prevents hybridization between humans and chimps. Or he could have made us as different as chimpanzees are from jellyfish. Anything in there is acceptable in the creation model. According to Rob Carter here, he's saying that the biblically created kinds are approximately following the biological species concept. If they can interbreed and produce viable offspring, then they are of the same created kind. Well, that doesn't follow with the kind lists that we see given out by Answers in Genesis, which have dogs and foxes as members of the same created kind, who objectively cannot interbreed and create viable offspring with one another. So, so, like, this creates a very different schematic of where the biblically created kinds are drawn and, frankly, creates way too many created kinds that can be accommodated on Noah's Ark. This is why Ken Ham created the kinds at the family level, but maybe Rob Carter doesn't hold to Ken Ham's, like, barriers for where the created kinds are. Maybe he doesn't agree with Ken Ham. Okay, cool, but then you have to create your own model that stands on its own to be peer-reviewed. Despite how we know how you feel about peer review, it is how science works, Dr. Carter. Carter talks about how evolutionary biologists and geneticists didn't publish a predicted percentage that would turn out to be the case for human and chimp genomic similarity. And like, no, they didn't. I don't know why they would do that. The prediction is that humans would be closest to the great apes as compared to any other animals. And then it turned out to really blow everyone's mind because we weren't just most similar to chimps, but chimps were most similar to us and humans nested very firmly within the family hominidae. But then he hammers home on the waiting time problem again. Now, in one sense, 
it doesn't really matter to evolution how similar we are. Just the similarity is the similarity. But in another sense, there is a limit because it takes time for mutations to propagate in a population. I did a whole episode called the waiting time problem on that. Put very simply, the waiting time problem is an argument that's put out mostly by intelligent design advocates, but also young earth creationists like Rob Carter here. That video that he showed there actually has been responded to by Dan of Creation Myths, and quite robustly, I think. To my knowledge, Carter has not covered that response, has not addressed the criticisms levied against him uh, by Dan. But the waiting time problem can be summarized as looking at the divergence between modern humans and modern chimpanzees, the differences that we have between one another in our total genomic assessment, right? The percent differences between the two species. Carter and other creationists would argue that if the divergence point is like 6.5 to 7 million years ago, there isn't enough time for all of those mutations to accumulate if the difference between the two species is roughly four to five to six percent, looking at that 95 to 96 percent difference that is generally accepted by the genetics community. Carter and others would say that difference, even though the total similarity between the two species is enormous, that difference is too large too large of a gap to be traversed within the time period allotted to paleontology and genetics based off of the hominins that we find and the molecular clock. And if we're less than 99% similar, they might not have enough time, even if we're millions of years, to drive the differences between humans and chimpanzees. In fact, I don't think they can do it at all, but using a lot of evolutionary assumptions, they might be able to get to 99%, maybe, maybe 98% but almost certainly nothing less than that. So like I said, Dan of Creation Myths already did a pretty big deep dive into the waiting time problem. And I'll put a link to his channel and his video in the description because you should check it out. But he summarizes three major conceptual problems that the waiting time problem just absolutely bungles. The first is that it assumes that mutations, the differences between humans and chimps, have to happen like one at a time serially rather than in parallel. We know from experimental work that this is simply not how evolution works, not by a long shot. The waiting time problem also doesn't take into account recombination, which is a huge huge no-no when you're trying to tally up how long it's going to take something to evolve theoretically if you were moving backwards into time. And finally, Dan notes that the waiting time problem assumes that there is some kind of goal or target to evolution and that there is only one conceivable path to get there, which we know, again, experimentally, is false. Dan also notes in his video that creationists like Carter who are proposing the waiting time problem will often throw out numbers like 30 million differences. This is how many beneficial mutations that humans have to have to explain the differences between us and chimpanzees. And one thing that Dan noted right off the bat, which I've not seen Carter really address, is humans don't need 30 million mutations. We need 15 because humans are evolving from the last common ancestor and so are chimpanzees. So each lineage is evolving 15 million beneficial mutations. If we're taking Carter at his word there, which, as you'll find out, we shouldn't. You may have heard before that most mutations aren't positive or negative, they are neutral. This is, in fact, true, and we can detect positive selection in the genome. So, believe it or not, like, scientists have already done this, specifically in relation to humans and chimpanzees. This was done all the way back in 2006, and wouldn't you know it, the number of positively selected alleles is not 30 million, it's not 15 million, it's around 1,000. Again, this matters because they are assuming for the waiting time problem in their calculations orders of magnitude greater than the actual experimental results for the differences between humans and chimps that need to undergo positive selection, as in have some kind of fitness benefit. If you go to Sanford's publication, which is the Young Earth Creationist, Beckley is uh, an intelligent design advocate, so they're going to have slightly different perspectives. They're using 150 million differences, right? And they're, again, expecting it along one lineage. So there are oodles and oodles of problems with the waiting time problem, issues I've not seen Carter address, um, but hopefully he'll watch this and he will then go forth and address them. Do it, Carter. Prove me wrong. Well, not me specifically, because I'm not a geneticist, but, you know, the community of geneticists and Dan.
Next, Carter talks about how Tompkins was right to be suspicious of the human and chimp genomic similarity because they used a human scaffold initially to assemble the human genome. And to that I say, well, that's kind of interesting because in my comparisons, I used Pantro 6 for the majority of the pairwise uh, alignments. The only time I didn't was when I was comparing the bonobo genome to the chimpanzee genome. And since the bonobo genome has not been assembled without a scaffold, I wanted to make sure that I was being consistent so the creatures couldn't come at me on that. But other than that, we used Pantro 6 every single time. Now, that again was assembled without a human scaffold, but that doesn't even matter because as Carter says here... But now we have better genomes, and to be fair, the original genome construction mostly came through. They did have to rearrange a few things, and there are some mistakes that they made, but it mostly came through. So it wasn't a good genome, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. But they shouldn't have done it that way anyway, because they actually didn't know. In fact, they got lucky. I'm sure Steve Schaffner and all of the other geneticists and computer scientists and professionals that worked on the assembly of the chimpanzee genome will be pleased to know that by your assessment, Rob Carter, they just got real lucky. What they were doing by your assessment wasn't actually appropriate, but they did get lucky since it turns out they were like mostly right anyways. That's probably not because they took into account the limitations of utilizing a human scaffold for a chimpanzee genome and took proper precautions when interpreting their results, knowing that things might be subject to change down the line. They probably just got lucky. They're going to love hearing that. Then Carter talks a little bit about Tompkins' methodology for maybe like 15-20 seconds, talking about like why Tompkins did what he did, why he had a right to be suspicious, and then he says this. Around the same time, Richard Buggs, who I believe is an evolutionist, he's a scientist in England, he came out with a number also, I think it was 85.5%. Not doing an apples to apples comparison, he's comparing everything. If you look at all the DNA, it's about 85.5%. That was a giant shot in the arm for the creationist community, and Tompkins' work looked like it was validated, and so we have this 85.5%. One thing I want to note here is that I hope you appreciate just how hesitant Rob Carter is in all of this to actually defend Jeff's numbers. You're going to see more of this a little later. There's a lot of Jeff feels that he's correct, or Jeff has dug in his heels, or as you see here, it seemed like Jeff's work was validated. Seemed. Except that in the year 2020, he produced a revised estimate of 96.6%. Carter then goes on a pretty long tangent here, talking about how he knew when he heard of this revised estimate that it must have been a change in methodology. And like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what the title says. That's what the abstract says too. That's what I said in my video. Yes, Bugs and Siemens, who was his PhD student at the time, did a different type of analysis on the human and chimpanzee genomes, and they got a 96% similarity between the two of them. And as soon as I heard that, I knew there must have been a change in the methodology because the human chimpanzee genomes didn't change that much. There must have been a change in the methodology. Then Carter says that he called Josiah Siemens, the first author on the paper, and had him walk him through what they did in the paper. As soon as he started talking, I knew exactly what had happened. They changed the methodology. Now, I can appreciate the desire for clarification here, but I think it was pretty clear just from reading the simplified abstract, right? Like, I feel like you could figure out just from reading the abstract, especially somebody who has a background in genetics, like Rob Carter, to know what's going on here. The, the differences in the methodology used by Siemens and Bugs versus Bugs in 2018. I guess this is just weird to me because Carter presents this as if it's like an aha moment, like something that maybe I didn't know about. But in my video, I mentioned that it's a new method. It ultimately doesn't even matter though, because in 2020, Richard Buggs published a new method of comparing genomes and found humans and chimps to be about 96% similar. Right, so again, the alarm bells are going off. Did Carter actually watch the video or didn't he? I mean, it was two hours long. That's, that's a pretty hefty task for someone to, to undertake, to sit down and view a video for two hours. If you're a skeptic, if you're an evolutionist, if, you're, if you believe in evolution, if you're a Christian who believes in evolution, or an evolutionist does believe in Christianity, or if you're a creationist, listen carefully. If 96.6 .6 is the best modern estimate of our similarity, the true similarity is necessarily less than that. 
for a full genomic comparison, I'm okay with this because the estimates from the evolutionary community are generally 95 to 96%. If we include the telomeres and the centromeres, because remember, indels are already included when we're talking about that 95, 96% estimate. So if when we take into account the centromeres and the telomeres, we see it drop another 1.6%, that's not going to be surprising to me or anyone else. Steve Schaffner has talked about this on various forums. He, he was on the team that assembled the chimpanzee genome all the way back in 2005. His estimate is that it's going to hover around 95 once you get that telomere to telomere full end-to-end -end sequence. So that's fine. But a really quick look-see at the size of telomeres and centromeres, as well as how much humans and chimps differ in our copy number variations, I don't think it's going to drop 1.6%. I think it's going to drop less than that. So, in the end, on one hand, I don't care how different we are. On the other hand, I'm a nerd, I want to know. It's an interesting question, I want to know. On the other, other hand, um, as long as it's less than is required by evolutionary theory, I also don't care how similar they are. It can be 98%, I'm happy with that. If it's on the edge, I'd be happier with 95%. 90% would be killer. If it's in the 80s, that'd be even better. Like we said, it's going to end up being like 95 to 96 percent, even once that telomere to telomere full completion is done, right? Now, if you want a discussion on Tompkins and the mistakes he may or may not have made, um, go listen to her long, two hour long video. There'll be a link below or read some of Jeff's articles where he explains why he does not believe he made a mistake. I'm just going to leave that hanging out there because honestly, the answer doesn't matter. So remember, this was meant in part to be a response video to my video, and yet he's, he's staying out of it, you guys. You're just gonna have to watch my long video and then read Jeff's articles and you can, you can make up your own mind. To me though, this is incredibly telling. The fact that Robert Carter isn't coming out swinging in defense of Jeffrey Tompkins' methodology like, why isn't he telling me what I did wrong in my assessment of Jeff's work, right? The fact that none of that is happening here is really solid validation, I feel, for my work in showing that Jeff's methods um, don't work and that humans and chimps are, in fact, about 95 to 96% similar to one another looking at the entire genome. But I think what's really funny about this video is when Carter accidentally reveals in the comments section that he probably did not watch the entire video. Yeah, so let's look at that. So here's the video. I made a community post about it and a lot of Guts and Gibbon enjoyers went over there and just started bodying Carter fans in the comment section, which is funny. But one of the first comments that I saw was this one by Mr. Dan Ang One, who says, the trouble is that doing the same thing Tompkins did with closely related animals, according to both creationists and geneticists, like lions and tigers or horses and donkeys generate similar numbers in the 80s and about 95%, using the same methods as commonly used on humans and chimps. He's basically saying like, this isn't going to work because Tompkins methods aren't consistently applied. You also get really low similarities in animals that creationists would say are members of the same kind. So we actually get a response from Rob Carter here, who says, I am unaware of any creationists who have duplicated his methods, him being Tompkins, on horses and donkeys, lions and tigers, etc. Remember, that's what I did, right? Not specifically on horses and donkeys because they have different chromosome counts and it's difficult to compare organisms that have different chromosome counts and blast, but in these types of pairs here. He says, I'm also unaware of any evolutionists who have duplicated his methods at all. Remember, that's the whole two hour video is me doing exactly that. That is, I do not trust they have actually, they actually have, and looking at what has been done clearly shows that different methods were used, just saying. So Depper Dino, friend of the channel, says, I see you didn't bother watching the video in which Guts Given did test it on lions and tigers, among other animals that are supposed to be in the same kind by creationists. <laughs> you could actually watch it, you know. Um, and I came in and, and said something similar. I said, hi there, Dr. Carter, this is precisely what I did. I thought you had watched the video. And to that, Carter says, he gives me a nice little response here. I'm not convinced you reproduced his methods, especially since his 2018 paper claimed to have used liberal gap extensions, yet he still got an answer in the mid 80s. So again, this is not inspiring confidence in me because the methods I reproduced was his 2011 to 2015 methods. I didn't need to recreate his 2018 methods because his own CSV that is available for download on GitHub uh, disproves him, right? Shows that in fact, his own methodology supports a roughly 96% similarity between humans and chimps once you weight your sequences. 
He says, thus, I cannot see how it is valid to slam him for not allowing gaps in his papers. Yes, he did take a while to get around to it, but that was five years ago. So here we have two people claiming opposite things about the same software. My point was to stand above the fray and try to explain things to the common person. An apples to apples comparison indicates 96.6%, great, but the real difference must be less than that, the real difference. How much less I did not say because I have not attempted to reproduce his methods nor yours. My brother in Christ, my methods were his methods methods. That was the point. And what kills me about this is part of the reason that that video was two hours long was because I explicitly showed my steps from where I go to his paper and show that his methods from his, his parameters, specifically in his methodology section, right, his methods section are copied and pasted into my program. That's part of the reason the video was so long, was to show, to prove empirically to anyone watching that I did in fact replicate his methods to a T. Now what is a little weird here is I responded to this comment with a new comment. And that comment seems to be gone. Either that or I just can't find it, but I'm on an incognito tab so it seems to me that the comment is gone. Here's what it did say. I quote Biblical Genetics saying, I'm not convinced he reproduced his methods, especially since his 2018 paper claimed to have used liberal gap extension and yet he still got an answer in the mid 80s. And to this I said, this is how I know you didn't bother to watch my video. I tested his 2011 through 2015 methods in BLAST, performing additional pairwise comparisons. His 2018 methods I examined using his own published CSV files, which show he did not weight his sequences. This means a 30,000 base pair sequence that is 99% similar is weighted the same as a 300 base pair sequence that is 50% similar. I go over the methodological problems with both his pre-2015 methods and post-2015 methods in my video. If you had watched it, you would know I replicated his methods precisely because I copied and pasted his exact published parameters into my own BLAST program. These parameters return an approximately 84% similarity between Han and Japanese populations and is thus indefensible. Jeff can easily prove me wrong though. He just has to do exactly what I did, use his methods and compare a pair of organisms outside of a human and a chimp. This would act as a control and ground his results. But he didn't do that and he he hasn't done that. I also reached out to Dr. Bugs to clarify some things with regard to his 2018 and 2020 work. I hope to discuss my conversation with him and how it impacts creationism when I cover the video you have published here on my own channel. You also misrepresent me. I did not say Jeff was ill-equipped to run those comparisons because he is a plant geneticist. I am retroactively using his expertise in plant genetics to excuse him for all the mistakes he made in the human chimp comparison. I am trying, against my better judgment, to assign his work to ignorance rather than deceit. How However, none of the other geneticists who looked at my work, and his for that matter, felt my charity was warranted. I specifically took a screenshot of this comment because I was worried it would disappear. And well, here we are. There's one more thing I want to talk about that's going on in the comments here, and it has to do with Apologetics 101. Apologetics 101 is a newer apologetics YouTube channel, and the reason I know them is because they watched my Jeffrey Tompkins lambasting video, and then shortly after had an interview with Jeffrey Tompkins and attempted to suss out the reason why um, he could still excuse Jeffrey Tompkins' work in that video. Uh, it didn't go over very well. In fact, the question and answer section was, in my opinion, disastrous for Tompkins. But Apologetics 101 has decided to take personal issue with my busting of Jeffrey Tompkins and is putting together some kind of mega response video. We'll see if it's worth responding to when it comes out. Allegedly, we're getting a Tompkins interview in it. So I certainly hope that we, we get some answers to our questions on Tompkins' methods. But one thing in particular that Apologetics 101 has recently just been plastering over any comment section that will listen is that he has actually interviewed Richard Bugs because if you'll recall in my video, I talk about how Richard Bugs seemingly has changed his mind on the 84% that he sort of published and Tompkins used to pretend like there was an evolutionary biologist that corroborated him back in like the late 2010s. It was a whole thing. Here's a clip from the video that explains that. Bugs is a geneticist and a conventional one by all accounts. He caused a bit of a stir in the 2010s in some circles because he actually felt that 84% similarity between humans and chimps was appropriate. He got this number by maximizing differences as well, counting each base difference as a difference in and of itself and counting the unsequenced regions at the time in the dissimilar category. Of course, Bugs was okay with counting differences like this across the animal kingdom. All gaps would widen and humans and chimps would still be one another's closest living relatives. 
This didn't stop countless creationists from name-dropping him, nor did it stop Tompkins from specifically claiming that their work corroborated one another's. Now, we could go into the details as to why some people did find Richard Bugs's method of counting up differences to be appropriate, but it's basically akin to debating whether or not you should count a page duplication in a book as a duplication of a page, or every letter as a singular difference when accounting the total similarity between the two books. It ultimately doesn't even matter though because in 2020 Richard Bugs published a new method of comparing genomes and found humans and chimps to be about 96% similar. I guess he finally came around. So Apologetics 101 thought that was sussy and decided to reach out to Richard Bugs himself and here's what he has to say about that. He said the email had to come in from Richard Bugs confirming Dr. what Dr. Rob Carter said in the above video. Quote, Josiah Siemens' paper does not try to do the same kind of comparison as my 2018 blog article. It does not take into account all types of differences that the 2018 article does. Unquote. This email has been forwarded over to Donnie Badinsky of the Standing for Truth Ministries. Erica, you have been refuted. <laughs> now, this is epic. Well, here's the thing, Apologetics 101. You usually want to save these kinds of big reveals that you contacted somebody for your actual response video. That's a YouTuber tip from one YouTuber to another. It creates um, suspense and you get like a nice punchline at the end of the video because you've been posting this everywhere. So I also just went ahead and emailed Richard Bugs, and you're not going to like the conversation we had. But because I'm a professional YouTuber on the side as my side hustle, um, I'm going to save that punchline for when we review your mega debunk of, of my Tompkins material, right? We're gonna do like a nice little suspense here. This is how the pros do it. Plus, I actually just want to make sure that Dr. Bugs is okay with me sharing our conversation. Now, if you will recall, the last time Apologetics 101 talked to Jeffrey Tompkins about the experiments that I ran utilizing his methods, his response, him being Tompkins, was, well, I doubt she ran her methods because my computer is big and strong and she couldn't have possibly run my methods with a weak computer. I just don't believe her that she reran my methods because she probably doesn't have a, a computer that's as big as strong as my computer is. Um, and to that I say, like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, guys, but, like, you can, you can run the same program that Jeff is talking about on, like, a weaker computer. It just takes a lot longer. Right, this this is pretty simple stuff. This is like rendering, you know, graphics or a video or something like that on a on an older computer. It's going to take longer than on a newer computer, but both will still get the job done. Okay, that's it's just how this kind of stuff works. I don't understand why he thought that would be a viable response. Uh, but then we got this Carter response that was also not a real response, was it? You know, it kind of seems like both the genetics guys, both the creationist genetics guys taking the, a swing at me here, trying to say my methods in debunking Jeffrey Tompkins were not appropriate or sufficient. Seems like both of them just kind of put their hands up and said, eh, we just don't believe you. We don't believe you did his methods correctly. Well, if you'd watched the whole two hour video, you'd see that I did, wouldn't you? Anyways, my gentle and of course very modern apes, I thought this was a very fun thing to respond to. You'll notice that this was a sort of um, carpet bomb drop with Dan of Creation Myths and also Dapper Dino. They were both um, around the last time we kind of used Carter as a punching bag here. So we thought we'd do a little triple release again. So please do check out their videos. Uh, tell me what you think in the comments of Carter's response. Did you think it, <laughs> did you think it sufficiently proved that I don't know what I'm talking about? Did you think that, that it got the job done? Um, if you like what I do, please consider supporting me in a free way. You can like and comment and subscribe, all of those things. And if you want to support me in a financial way, you can join my Patreon, where you will sometimes get early access to videos. Sometimes. I think they got early access to this one. So hooray for that. And in the meantime, you guys, please do take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time.